everyone, and welcome to the Kathy Reisowitz Show. I am Kathy Reisowitz, and today I am joined by current sex worker and brilliant author, Brazen Lee. She is currently performing sex work in Canada, and I wanted to have her on today to talk about a really moving and beautiful piece that she wrote from her perspective working in the industry. It's called An Open Letter to Anti-Sex Work Activists. Thank you so much, Brazen, for coming on today. So tell me about the piece, the argument you're making, what kind of prompted you to write it, um, and what the response has been. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor. Um, I guess it sort of came out of just frustration from dealing with quote-unquote activists who call themselves feminists and who call themselves radical, mostly on Twitter, who were harassing me and harassing a lot of other workers I know and who were speaking in language that I found really dehumanizing and they were doing it under the guise that they found sex work dehumanizing and they were trying to help us and save us. And I found that a lot of them sort of were under the impression that I didn't understand patriarchy and that I don't understand, you know, the power dynamics in our world. And so I guess I just wanted to write it to say, hey, like, I'm with you on all of these things and we agree that we live in a pretty fucked up society. Um, but you telling mostly women, because let's be honest, they don't care about men workers, male workers. They don't care about trans workers if they even acknowledge trans identities, which they usually don't. Um, and the point was basically to say, look, it's not radical or feminist to try to tell people what to do with their lives and their bodies, whether you agree with it or not, and whatever your thoughts are about sex work. You know, my idea of feminism is that we empower women and everyone to make the choices that they want to make, especially if they're not hurting anyone. So it came from that place. And I really liked how I feel like a lot of, I follow a lot of sex work Twitter and a little bit of mainline feminist Twitter. And the two kind of talk past each other a lot of the time. I feel like, you know, the, the sex workers who are on Twitter are definitely a more empowered bunch. And there's rarely a recognition that sex work, the way it, sex work operates in a patriarchal society. And so in a society where women are kept out of, uh, you know, capital accumulation and are prevented from accumulating power, sex work is going to be no different. And the consent exists on a continuum. Like that's the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I like how you, acknowledge those realities while still in the end advocating for okay yes we're operating in a system where women have limited choices further limiting those choices and making certain choices uh, result in prison time and police abuse and you know not having your your property rights protected doesn't actually solve those problems in any way shape or form and in fact it just exacerbates them so I really liked how you're, mm -hmm. you're acknowledging, you know, both realities, uh, which I feel like a lot of, um, you know, comparatively empowered sex workers, you know, either aren't as intimately familiar with or are a little bit afraid to do because it's like if we admit that the way sex work operates, especially at the lower level, is pretty exploitative, then that, you know, gives some credence to criminalization and you're saying, well, no, it, a it actually doesn't. Like, that's true and criminalization is still not an okay solution to that problem. So I really liked that a lot. Yeah, well, I, I don't know, maybe we follow very different people, but most of the workers I follow do understand the power dynamics, and they and myself, I don't necessarily agree that sex work is inherently exploitative. I think we live in a very exploitative system, but I don't think sex work is special in any way. I think that there's definitely the potential, and mostly the potential for exploitation is because of criminalization. Absolutely. Um, so I no, I don't think, I don't think, so, I don't, yeah, no, sex work is not inherently exploitative at all. The way that it happens now ends up being, at the lower end of the uh, socioeconomic spectrum, you know, sex work is, is dangerous and it's problematic. But, I mean, that's true of any job at the lower end of the spectrum. You have fewer protections. You have less safety. You have, mm -hmm. you know, shittier working conditions. That's true of fast food versus 
it's fine dining, and it's true of sex work as well. Yeah. But I think sex work is even, and I think the reason it is is because of criminalization, and it's different that, in the, you know, compared to fast food workers who say if they were attacked on the job, they could call the cops, and the right. cops would be like, oh, well, you know, you work in McDonald's, so, you know, you were asking for it. What do you expect? So I think that... And that's the thing with criminalization that a lot of anti-sex work activists don't get. And, you know, I agree with them. Trafficking and exploitation are horrible, but criminalizing people who are just trying to survive and who choose this work, who aren't just trying to survive, who actually enjoy it, is definitely not the answer. And that's just a layer of fucked upness, if I may make up a word, in my opinion. <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> Another thing that I really liked about the piece is when you talked about your experience, I, and I'm not sure how to put this, but um, as a fat woman and hmm. operating in patriarchal ideas about, you know, our narrow standards of beauty, and um, hmm. I don't know, I just thought that was really fascinating how it it's almost like enabled you to own your beauty that sex work has. I don't know. Yeah, it kind of Why has. did you include that? Sorry. Go ahead. Um, well, it was weird. When I first started doing it, I, I definitely started doing sex work because I couldn't find a job. Like, I'm a pretty skilled uh, artist and designer, um, and I was having a hard time finding work, and I was broke. And I asked my boyfriend at the time, I'm like, what if I started, you know, because guys are always into my boobs. I was like, what if I just started charging money for people to see my boobs? And it sort of evolved from there to me doing full service. And at first, it was really shocking because every client I would meet was so hot. I thought they were all cops. I was like, you, like, you can't be possibly coming to pay me because these are guys that I would never even think to hit on before. So I think, oh, like, that guy would never go for me. He's so, so really conventionally attractive. And that's probably the majority of the clients that I deal with. I think it's a lot of guys who are ashamed that they're attracted to larger women. And so they see escorts, which is fine. I mean, it's not fine that they're ashamed, but, you know, it's great to exploit that shame. Um <laughs> And, I mean, even the ones that, you know, I'm not necessarily into or not necessarily conventionally attractive, it's nice when, you know, people are paying you to just kind of worship your body and be like, well, what do you like? What turns you on? So that was really not at all what I was expecting when I started doing this work. I thought it would just be a really service-oriented job. And I know that my experience is somewhat unique compared to a lot of the workers I know who are deaf, who are more conventionally attractive. Um, but yeah, I get a lot of a lot of that, a lot of adoration and worship and service oriented clients, which is great. Like who doesn't want to get paid, you know, two hundred and fifty dollars an hour to get massaged in a candlelit room. But you're being exploited, Brazen. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Can I just can I just finish my massage though? It's so nice. <laughs> yeah, no. no, I think that that's fascinating. It's something that I I believe is a feminist issue and that nobody really wants to talk about. The way that men police each other's preferences. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of stigma that men put on each other. I've seen it where mm -hmm. a man will have a genuine preference for a larger woman or... Um, you know, just a woman who's not, doesn't, for whatever reason, fit into our very narrow standards, usually at size, and um, men will just, will just police the shit out of that, and it's really, really sad, and um, it's something that I wish we could challenge instead of, again, it's good for you that, that men are ashamed and that they're <laughs> massaging well, their feet in private, but it sucks for everyone else, you know? Um, and it's and I, it's something that I think feminism needs to talk about, not yeah. just ending body shame, but ending... Because women don't really have that. I mean, there really isn't... I guess there's a little bit of shame in dating, I guess, you know, maybe like a poor guy, but uh, not to the same level, yeah. certainly. Well, our, I mean, our... 
the way that we're sort of gendered is kind of different in that women are supposed to seek status in a man's position and men are sort of supposed to seek it in a woman's looks. Um, yeah. And while it is great for me in my work because it lets me exploit that shame, you know, it's not easy for me dating, especially being a fat sex worker. That's just another layer of like, oh, undateability. She's a sex worker, she's fat, she's poor, she's kind of crazy sometimes. So, um, yeah. But yeah, I definitely agree. I wish we could challenge that more. And I wish men would challenge each other more on it. Um, mm -hmm. But there are, some, there are some brave men out there who just soldier on and say, F you, I don't care what you think. So I'm told. <laughs> out there. <laughs> they are. And I, I also thought it was really interesting um, how you talk about sex work, you know, helping solve the loneliness problem, you know, for you and for them. And, you know, like you said, that's you're not selling release, you're selling kind of a respite from that crushing loneliness that we feel. And it's like, we've decided that I, I, I think of sex work as um, making the transactional nature of sex explicit and hmm. you know we, we've we've created these yeah. systems like Craigslist to facilitate other exchanges mm -hmm. but somehow making it easier for people to connect you know that a medium of exchange would make it easier for people to connect like we get that a medium of exchange makes it easier for people to meet other needs Mm -hmm. And we don't have a problem with it. But with sex, it's this weird, you know, no-go. Um, well, I think it's in the, explicit, in the explicity. Is that the right word? Um, because when you think about things, like the way our systems are set up, uh, some people use dating as a similar form of sex for money, goods, services, dinner. Same as marriage for some people. Some people, lots of people have marriages of convenience which I sometimes call monogamous prostitution. Um, and those things are seen as okay. Like my mom once was, when she when I told her that I was a sex worker, she was really upset and really judgmental. And I was like, well, mom, you once dated a man for three years because you wanted him to fix the thing in your yard. So, you know, it's really not that much different. The only difference is I'm doing it ethically and I'm not, you know, making someone think I love them. It's just an honest transaction. And I think that's kind of where the problem is, that it's women sort of taking... I mean, it's not just women, but people only have a problem when it's women. And a lot of it is women taking control of that transaction, which is wonderful. But I think that's where the problem comes from, more moralistic types. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Because, you know, if it was all about exploitation, they would, they would care about all genders of workers. They would care about exploitation in every other field. And they'd be trying to abolish every industry that exploits people, which is pretty much any industry. So <laughs> I would focus on sex work. <laughs> well, and I, it's all wrapped up, too, because I feel like people are rightly aware that women are at a disadvantaged place in society in a lot of transactions and in a lot of ways. So, you know, a Ironically, woman and a man really, entering... Sorry. Pardon me? Ironically, though, not really within sex work. In sex work, we it's one of the only industries where women make more money than men. Mm -hmm. Which Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and where we have a lot of the power and where we sort of dominate the market. I mean, a lot of it is run by men, but um, I think the majority of it is run by the workers. So. Especially as criminalization decreases, women are able to and feel comfortable, you know, not needing as much security and not needing third parties to facilitate transactions. Yeah. Ironically, criminalization further disenfranchises women by forcing them to rely on these intermediaries and protectors. Absolutely. And not only that, but economically too, you know, if I could work from home, um, I would have so much more work. If I was able to, like, I'm I'm kind of working now, but I'm only seeing people that I know because I'm so paranoid about police and the C36 business. And, you know, I don't do it from home because I could get evicted. But if it was not criminalized, I could easily do that. And a lot of people could. And I'm sure a lot of street-based workers could probably work indoors as well, which 
I know is what a lot of folks have an issue with because they consider it a nuisance, which I don't necessarily agree with. But And I don't necessarily think that people should have to move indoors, but if we were able to, I'm sure a lot of people would. And it definitely would be a lot safer and a lot easier and not, you know, I wouldn't have to pay $100 an hour for an in-call and then what if the client doesn't show up? You're just out that money. So there's that too. The whole sex work, outdoor sex work is a nuisance. I mean, I was in Germany a week before last and looking, I walked through a neighborhood where there were, you know, street walkers and, um, you know, they looked healthy and happy and mm -hmm. had their shimmering tights on and were just standing there and it was a bar, sex worker, bar, sex worker. And it was like, they weren't bothering anyone. They weren't bothered. It was, it was all legal and there was nothing... No, nothing wrong with it. The nuisance mm -hmm. is I don't want a cop raping a sex worker near me, right? The nuisance is I don't want sex workers afraid for their safety near me. The nuisance yeah. is criminalization. I agree. I totally agree. I just think that some more privileged types or, you know, people who move into gentrified neighborhoods or people who live near strolls, people who complain about a quote-unquote nuisance, I think that a lot of them are just uncomfortable with it. I think a lot of them have issues with class, the same way they would have issues with, say, a group of men of color in their neighborhood if they're racist. I don't know. I think it's a similar kind of dynamic, and I don't think it's necessarily that the workers are bothering anyone. It's just they sort of have an idea of what's going on, and they don't like it, so they say, well... It's, it's othering. Yes, absolutely. Totally. So what's going on with criminalization in Canada right now? <laughs> well, um, so the Bedford decision, um, now I'm not an academic on this, and I can give you some resources if people would like to learn more um, about this, but from what I know, so the Bedford decision came down on December 20th or 21st, and they basically struck down three of the laws around sex work and deem them unconstitutional. One was communicating in public, so that's basically the law that was targeting street-based workers, and that's where most of the arrests were happening. Um, and they struck down the body house rule, which stated, you know, you can't work indoors with multiple people and use the same place regularly for work, and living off the avails. So that meant, you know, a pimp, for example, or your landlord who's getting your rent money, or your child who you're supporting with your money could technically be charged with pimping or procuring, not procuring, sorry, um, but living off the avails. Those three rules were struck down. Um, and so the government has a year, they have until December 20th or 21st of this year to pass new laws, or to not, and so now what they're doing is trying to pass this C-36 bill, which has someone on a dating site that I'm speaking to called it sub-barbaric, which I think is absolutely correct. Um, so they're basically, not only are they going to recriminalize what the Supreme Court just struck down, they're going to do it in a much more serious way. So I can talk a little bit more about that if you want, about C-36. Um, but that's where they're at now. They're trying to get that passed in the House of Commons. So what do you, rather than talk about what's wrong with that, because I think broadly we understand, um, what do you and other sex workers propose instead? Most sex workers I know, myself included, would propose something similar to the New Zealand model, which is decriminalized sex work. It's not legalized. Um, I don't think it's legalized. And it's run more through public health than through law enforcement. Um, yeah. A lot of folks are calling for the Nordic model. They're calling to criminalize the purchase or to criminalize clients, but that's still criminalization. And that is problematic and doesn't work for a number of reasons. So personally, Absolutely. I would like to do something like the New Zealand model. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I've read that the uh, the... The Nordic model has several problems. First, just mm -hmm. it has had zero effect on the amount of prostitution that happens in the country. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, it's moved prostitution uh, indoors, and um, 
it's which doesn't change whether it happens or not, but it, it's just moved where it is. Um, it's made it a little bit more difficult for sex workers to organize and share information, and it's mm -hmm. made sex workers more dependent on third parties to facilitate transactions. So mm -hmm. there's zero success and a lot of harassment and problems with the Nordic model. Yeah. And a lot of it's actually moved from Sweden to Norway, which oh. is across a bridge and which is not, just, is not criminalized, I believe. Um, yeah. Interesting. We definitely okay, don't well, want thank that. you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. We're about out of time. But, Raisin, where can people find out more about the struggle and read more of your delicious writing? Oh, thanks. Um, okay, so I have a blog, which is raisinlee.blogspot.com. I also have a website which is risqueforte.com, R-I-S-Q-U-E-F-O-R-T.com, where I sell poetry books and sexy art. That's my art in the background. Um, that's my stuff. I'm also on Twitter at Brazen Lee. Um, a good place to learn about what's going on in Canada is Pivot Legal. Um, there's numerous Twitter activists. I'll put a blog post up later today with some links. Uh, that people can go check out to a whole bunch of different Twitter activists that they can look at. Maggie's is great. Maggie's Toronto, Spock, SPOC, Stella, Power. Those are all great, great starting points if you want to learn more about the struggle in Canada. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone important. I probably am, but I'll put up a blog post later. That's a little more, hopefully a little more thorough. All right. Well, thank you again for coming on. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Please like, comment, share, subscribe. Thank you so much for having me.